Hi everyone, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Bedscape Cardiology, and I'm here at the American Heart Association meeting in Philadelphia, and I'm excited to have Professor Jeff Healy from McMaster University, who was a primary investigator of the Artesia trial. Artesia is a really important trial because it addresses the question of what to do with patients who have short duration subclinical AF. So Jeff, welcome and thanks for being with us. Thanks for the invite, John. Tell us about what you found right off the bat and then we'll uh, go into the details. Sure. So subclinical atrial fibrillation, pacemaker and ICD patients, we found among those with six minutes to 24 hours of subclinical atrial fibrillation that apixaban reduced the risk of stroke or embolism by approximately one third with about a 50% reduction in large strokes uh, which were disabling or fatal. To balance that, there was also an increase in the risk of major bleeding, uh, which uh, was a hazard ratio of 1.8 on our on-treatment analysis. Just a few weeks ago, we heard about NOAA, which was edoxaban versus placebo, but 50% of that control arm was on uh, aspirin. How, why did you pick aspirin, and how does that influence the interpretation of these sure. lower stroke rates, higher bleeding rates? Sure, so aspirin was based on the patients themselves. So at the beginning of the trial, prior to randomization, two thirds of our patients took an antiplatelet agent, aspirin, clopidogrel, or something else. And this is you know, the baseline why we chose this as a comparator. But also, as you recall, there's a difference between NOAA and Artesia here, and it's born out of the difference between the American and the European approach to atrial fibrillation from 10 to 15 years ago, right? For many low-risk individuals here in North America, we used aspirin for low-dose individuals, and there was this expectation when we approached sites to participate that we have to try something with our patients who have this, and there was this um, culture of using low-dose aspirin here in America that wasn't present in Europe as they had abandoned it from their guidelines much earlier. So I think that's why the difference between the two trials. In terms of the effect, aspirin will um, possibly modestly reduce the risk of stroke. The, the meta-analysis suggests at most a 20% reduction, so not a big reduction, but of course is associated with the risk of bleeding and so would increase compared to placebo. A third to a half of individuals different between the trials where the control arm uh, wasn't uh, active therapy in NOAA where it was aspirin across the board with Artesia. What kind of patients were in Artesia? So first of all, this is a very common problem. You and I are both electrophysiologists. If you take over 65 with hypertension, roughly one third will have this. So this is common. Episodes had to be six minutes to 24 hours. We didn't allow any longer episodes, unlike uh, NOAA, and furthermore, if during the course of the trial patients developed longer episodes, they were taken off study medication and treated with an anticoagulant. So that's the high rate events. CHADS, we were looking for an enriched population, right? So this is lower risk than clinical AFib, so we went for a higher risk group. So a minimum CHADS VAS score of three. Uh, we did allow patients with prior stroke or age greater than 75 as a sole risk factor because those are such important risk factors. So that's the population that we studied. But the CHADS VAS score was entry criteria was three, but it was actually higher in enrolled patients? Um, minimum, yes. Okay, okay. So there were some very high CHADS VAS patients. And what was the median duration of the episodes? Yeah. How short? Yeah, so it's one and a half hours. So that's shorter than NOAA. Speaks to the difference in uh, the upper cutoff that we used that they didn't use. And shorter than in the trials, observational trials like ASSERT, which probably speaks to some degree of selection bias uh, that we had here. We've all been discussing in our groups is this really low stroke rate. And we saw that in NOAA. And of course, the, the hazard ratio for NOAA was definitely favoring the DOAC but it didn't reach statistical significance because stroke rates were low, and you also found uh, low stroke rates, even though high CHADS VAS score, uh, and so there's something different about this. From our assert trial, we knew that we were dealing with a different entity in terms of relative and absolute risks, right? And this is, you know, why we defined this 24-hour cutoff, where they started to behave the same as clinical atrial fibrillation. So we really focused in on this pre-AF stage, However, as we found out during the trial, about one in four patients within the first year and a half goes on to progress to clinical AFib or longer episodes. So, you know, we really focused on this early, early window. And so, uh, yes, it is, it is a lower risk of stroke. Um, the across the board is around 1.24% per year on aspirin. And again, I think it's, it, it's a very interesting place to be and where we'll really need to understand the clinical risk factors, the features of the arrhythmia itself, duration, burden that influence risk, maybe even some of the echo factors that we all collected because 
You know, Chad's VASC for AFib was built around identifying low risk patients under 1% per year where we didn't have to anticoagulate. Right. Um, so that treatment threshold, if you will, is somewhere in that one to one and a half percent per year. And this lines up quite in the middle. So I think what we will find without revealing any data which are just currently being analyzed, we all know that there are many good stratifying tools, you know, age, prior history of stroke, uh, Chad's VASC, and many new ones that we're exploring here. And if you're getting an average risk in that range on aspirin, uh, I think it, it's, it's highly probable that we'll define significant subgroups where the risk will be even higher. And the treatment, the risk benefit ratio, uh, ratio weighing will be a little more obvious for clinicians. I can't tell you how excited we will be to learn that there's better risk stratification coming than Chad's VASC. You have a clear stroke reduction, statistically significant, um, but yet there's a trade-off between uh, higher uh, bleeding. When my partner calls me up and asks me what we should do with this, you know, a two-hour episode of AFib, what do you think? It's a very complex problem, hence the question, and there are many factors to consider. Patient preference, uh, which generally favors stroke avoidance rather than bleeds because of the significance. We've tried to take in the paper looking just at the facts in the study so far, but there are these other factors, guideline committees, health economics, this all has to be weighed in. But what we looked at in the trial was assessing not just, you know, a major bleed and a stroke, but rather what did they look like. So the Rankin score, modified Rankin score, is a very nice way to break down, you know, were these small strokes that people walked away and, and said, hey, no big deal. Uh, but what we found, which was surprising to me, was about half, about 45% of the strokes were in the rank in three to six score. So this is permanent, moderate, severe disability or death. And these are in, not trivial strokes. On the other hand, on the bleeding side, about 85% of the bleeding in the apixaban arm was resolved with just observation or you know, simple interventions, including crystalloid and blood transfusion. But in the very severe, you needed surgery or the bleed led to death. This is less than 15% and numerically similar in both groups, as were fatal bleeds and intracranial bleeds. So again, you know, is it a, you know, you're weighing a problem that occurs for a few days versus a problem that gives lifelong impact uh, in strokes. So, the, you know, it's not going to be a flat comparison one-to-one, -one, but again, it, this is going to require further analysis. You know, Jeff, I have to say that now I'm confused because I was at ESC when Professor Kirchhoff stood up and said, this is practice changing. We don't want to treat these patients with anticoagulants. It's a different interpretation, I think. Is this true? It's, uh, it's a different conclusion, but yeah. I think the data speak the same message. At the sessions, we will see uh, results of a meta-analysis. Anyone who's read both papers, which are now out there, can see if you look at the confidence intervals of all the outcomes, stroke, bleeding, they overlap quite a bit. So we may be dealing with simple issue of statistical power between the trials, a difference in choice of primary outcome, the artesia including a very narrow focus on stroke and embolism, uh, NOAA including a broader focus including things like cardiovascular death which may be or we know to be less responsive to anticoagulant. I really worry that it's not like going to be an algorithmic answer. I mean we're going to have to think in clinic about, about um, stroke risk reduction, uh, bleeding increase, and, and, and mixing that into what patients value. Of course, that's why we have doctors. Yeah, I think there was a famous, uh, famous doctor, Dr. Sackett, who came from your area, yeah. who talked about you know, best evidence and mixing that in. Well, Jeff, uh, excellent. Uh, this is such, a, such an important trial, and I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, very good.